Well, we're going to make a start, so welcome. Uh, welcome if you're with us in live for the first time. Welcome if you're joining us on Zoom. And welcome if you're logging on to YouTube. We are hopeful that at least the YouTube feed will work. We're having some problems with the church Wi-Fi network. So you, those of you on Zoom, um, I apologise. It, it may, hi, hi, hi David, uh, it may just blank off at any minute. Uh, either that or it's going to cost me like a thousand pounds in um, network fees. But anyway, <laughs> the Lord knows, doesn't he? The Lord knows. Okay, so we'll, we'll make a start. Um, firstly, can I give you a warm welcome to our time together this morning? It's good to be able to come together around God's Word and around the table. We're doing things in a little different order today, and you'll see why uh, in a few moments. But uh, a big welcome to however you're gathering with us. Um, as, as our call to worship, I'm going to ask um, David to come and read a section from Psalm, well, read Psalm 138 to us. So if David, you want to come. Psalm 138 says these words from the David Psalms. I give thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. For sorry, my strength of soul you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. And they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfil his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Amen. Thanks, David. When we come together to worship, we're called together by God himself as a demonstration of God's people and of, of course we're limited in what we can do today and um, we're going to be talking today about words so I'm going to pray and ask God's blessing upon our time and then we're going to go straight into God's word and we're in a sense we're going to put God's word first and then look at everything else we do this morning in the light of God's word often we do that the other way around we sort of save God's word to the end it's like saving the favorite part of your meal till last but we're going to do that differently today. But let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the words of the psalmist. Lord, he says that you have exalted your word and your name above all things. And Father, we thank you today that as your people, we can know you. We can know who you are. We can know the kind of God and the kind of saviour that you are. We can know you and you can, Lord, speak to us through your word. Father, we thank you that throughout the scripture, Lord, you are shown to be present by the fact that you are a speaking God. And Lord, you are present with us today by your spirit and through your word. Lord, as we come together in uh, worship, Lord, we recognize that all that we do together is worship. All that we do when we come together, whether it be prayers, prayer, whether it be uh, coming under the word, whether it could be coming around the table of the Lord, we reckon it is all worship. So, Lord, we pray that as we do that, you would encourage us. We thank you for one another. We thank you for those who are separated from us by means of work or by means of uh, uh, being, having still to shield or by means of sickness. Lord, we thank you for our brothers and sisters shed abroad. And we pray your blessing would be with them even as they join with us in a limited way. Father, we thank you for your goodness in all things. Lord, we recognize that your purpose, even as the psalmist says, your purposes, Lord, will prevail. And Lord, we want to be a people who are submissive to your purposes and uh, enjoy, enjoying of your, of your grace. Lord, help us today to concentrate on those things that we can do and not to lament too much those things that we're not able to do at present. We ask those things. We ask for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'm just going to, if I can just ask those on Zoom to mute yourselves, that, that, that helps us a little bit. Um, in terms of um, at least at least keeping keeping my feeble brain going without without wondering what that noise is, but that's brilliant. That's brilliant. 
Please turn with me in your Bibles then. To the firstly to the book of 1 Samuel. <coughs> We are, we are, believe it or not, carrying on our series through the book of Exodus, and we are going to look at the third commandment today. But I wanted just to preface this with a little, in a sense, a little uh, concrete example of the esteem that God gives to his name. This is uh, 1 Samuel 12, is Samuel's farewell address. And uh, this, is how, this is what it says. And Samuel said to all Israel, Behold, I have obeyed your voice in all that you have said to me, and have made a king over you. And now behold, the king walks before you, and I am old and grey. And behold, my sons are with you. I have walked before you from my youth until this day. Here I am. Testify against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or from, or from whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with it? Testify against me, and I will restore it to you. They said, you have not defrauded us or oppressed us or taken anything from, us, from any man's hand. And he said to them, the Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. And they said, he is witness. And Samuel said to the people, the Lord is witness who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Now therefore stand still that I may plead with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous deeds of the Lord that he has performed for you and for your fathers. When Jacob went into Egypt and the Egyptians oppressed them, then your fathers cried out to the Lord, and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. But they forgot the Lord their God, and he sold them into the land of Sisera, commander of the army of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of Moab, and they fought against them. And they cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned, because we have forsaken the Lord and have served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies, that we may serve you. And the Lord sent Jeroboam and Barak and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side and you lived in safety. And when you saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, no, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was king. And now behold, the king whom you have chosen, for whom you have asked, behold, the Lord has set a king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord, your God, it will be well. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. Now therefore stand still and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. Is not wheat harvest today? I will call upon the Lord. And he may send thunder and rain, and you shall know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord, in asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called upon the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God, that we may not die, for we have added to all our sins this evil, to ask ourselves a king. And Samuel said, Do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart, and do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people, for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and the right way, only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, as we've heard from the psalmist, 
You have exalted above all things your name and your word. Lord, in the history of your people, Lord, you have shown the connection between who you are and your name and your glory. Help us now by your word to, look, to learn to revere your name. Truly, Father, it is our first and ultimate prayer that you would exalt your name in all the earth. Give us grace to see you as you are and honour you as we should. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes. Without that title, Romeo doth thy name, and for thy name, which is no part of thee, take all myself. Those lines, of course, come from one of Shakespeare's most famous plays, Romeo and Juliet. The tragic account of two star-crossed lovers whose love is forbidden because they come from two rival families. He is a Montague, she a Capulet. It's sad, a really sad story, but lovely. Those are beautiful lines, but as Romeo and Juliet found out, names are not so easily discarded. What's in a name? Well, more than we might think. My the title of my message this morning is No Other Name. While it's true that a rose by any other name would smell as sweet, would roses be so popular if they were called something else? We understand that one of the most important things we do uh, for our children, almost the first thing we do, is to give them a name. One that they most often, hopefully, will, ha will bear for the rest of their lives. And we usually, those of us who have been parents, take that responsibility seriously. Some people might consult genealogies of our family histories. We, get those thick, we buy those thick books of baby names to look at the most popular names of the past year. Either to pick one or indeed to stay away from them altogether. Or we scour the Bible for ideas. I used to know a couple of friends of mine when I was at college who were, their surname was Wardrobe, which was bad enough as if you like, but, the, but their first names, they were twins. And, they were, and one was called Ezekiel and the other was called Obadiah. So when they were introduced, it was Ezekiel and Obadiah wardrobe. And I'm always thankful that my mum called me Gary, to be honest, in, in comparison. But we do strange things with names, don't we? We look, we look at them. We, we, uh, we look at what the, the, the child's initials will be to make sure that they don't say anything odd. We work out all every possible nickname that our children might give, be given so that other people won't be able to make fun of them. My children were called the biblical names of Matthew, Michael, and Haley, but not in that order, obviously. It was Michael first. Michael, Matthew, and Haley. Uh, if you can't find the, 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 the word Haley in the Bible, uh, come and see me later. <laughs> you know, it's not there, really. Uh, it turns out that names matter to God. And this morning we come to the third commandment. So if you want to turn over to Exodus 20, thankfully the reading here, after our long, after our long reading, is not so long. It's only one verse. It's Exodus 20, verse 7. It's the other one. Um, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who take his name in vain. I'll read that again. And it, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless, who takes his name in vain. We've seen that the first commandment so far prohibits the worship of false gods. We can understand, of course, why that's important. You have to worship the right God. The second commandment also prohibits worshipping God in the wrong way, specifically making invis the invisible God visible in ways of our own choosing and imagination. And we can understand why that is important. If God is invisible, then he's the only one who is allowed to make himself visible. Now he's done that in, in many ways through the uh, Old and New Testament, but, but he's done that ultimately through the person of Jesus Christ. 
So the first two commandments are ultimately fundamental to understanding what it means to be the people of God. Remember, that's what God is doing. He's speaking to Israel and he's telling them what it means to be the people of God. But if we're honest, when we come to the third commandment, we often struggle with this one a little bit. We might think, well, it's a little bit lighter. You know, it's, it's basically taken as, well, try and watch what you say. Let's not swear. The third commandment to many is often just seen as a good, um, a good guideline to live by. But if we think that this is not a serious offence as well, actually we would be mistaken. In, in Leviticus 24, 16, and I know that this is a civil law for the nation of Israel, um, we, we see a particular uh, commandment to Israel in Leviticus 24, it says this. Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him. The sojourner as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. That's how seriously the nation of Israel treated violation of the third commandment, that not taking the Lord's name in vain, not misusing the name of the Lord. I want to break this down, uh, hopefully quickly, and simply into five points this morning. Firstly, the commandment. Secondly, the cause. Thirdly, the categories. Fourthly, the consequence. And fifthly, the counterpart. Now, the good bits, some of these, some of these points are only one paragraph long. So that's good, isn't it? Okay. So the commandment then. It's interesting, if you look at this commandment in its context, and you look through Scripture, quite a broad range of things were prohibited in the third commandment. But what does it mean that we shall not take the name of the Lord in vain? The word vain, as it's rendered there in the English Standard Version, can mean empty. It can mean nothing. It can mean worthless. It can mean to no good purpose. Notice that verse 7 says, you shall not take the name. You, can, you could translate it, you shall not bear the name or take up the name. In other words, we are not to use the Lord's name, or we are not to use God's name carelessly, wickedly, or for wrong purposes. That doesn't mean, of course, that we can't use the divine name. The name, Yahweh, the Lord, as it's translated in most English versions, the covenant name of God. As we'll come to at the end, we are actually invited to use that name. We are part of his family. In a sense, he authorises us to use his name. But he authorises to use it in terms of using it properly. The covenant name of God, just for your information, appears more than 7,000 times in the Old Testament. So we don't need to be super, superstitious about saying his name. But we must not misuse it. Some of you who are interested in Old Testament history will know that the Jewish nation, the nation of Israel, became, in a sense, so superstitious about using it that they created laws around its use so that they wouldn't even use the name itself. They would substitute what they call a circumlocution. And they would say other words instead of saying the name of the Lord, including the Hebrew word Adonai, meaning Lord. They would use the, word, the phrase Hashem, meaning the name. Okay? They, they would sometimes, in, in a, a public reading like this, they would even miss the word out completely and they would just pause. When, uh, when the scribes would write the, the name of God, they would, they would only use a new pen to write that name. And then when they'd written it once, they would throw the pen away. Because they, it, because they didn't think it was right that a pen that had written the name of the Lord should write other normal words. Well, thankfully, we are beyond that. That's not something we have to do. But we are called here not to misuse it. So the commandment here is not, in a sense, merely just to not swear, but there are whole other categories involved in not misusing the name of the Lord. The Old Testament has a broad category of sins that fell under this, this prohibition. Most obviously, as the one we saw in Leviticus, you could not blaspheme or curse with the name of God. We saw that in Leviticus 24. Neither were you to use empty oaths in Leviticus 19. Uh, the Lord said that you shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God. It's quite interesting that a lot of activities were categorized under this idea of profaning the name of the Lord. So when people of Israel took oaths that they didn't intend to keep, 
That was, a, that was profaning the name of the Lord. When they swore by God's name uh, falsely, that was profaning the name of the Lord. The third commandment also prohibits false visions or prophecies. Jeremiah 23, 25 warns against prophets, prophets who lie, pro, who prophesy and lie in the name of the Lord. Strangely enough, sacrificing your children to the false god Molech, which, what, which the Canaanite nations did, and the Israelites also occasionally partook in horribly, that was considered in the Old Testament a violation of the third commandment. Uh, in Leviticus 18, it says, You shall not give any of your children to offer them to Molech, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. A person who did these things would be guilty of profaning God's name. And the community would be guilty if they did not, act, if they did not um, take action against the person who sacrificed his children to Molech. To touch unholy things, to, sorry, to touch holy things unlawfully was a violation of the third commandment, as it says in Leviticus 22 and in Malachi chapter 1. Even sorcery is a violation of this commandment in 2 Chronicles in Deuteronomy. Um, sorcery is outlawed because it's a violation of the third commandment. Why? Well, because in sorcery, or as the Jews understood it, you called upon the name of the Lord as if you can manipulate his power through words or incantations. In Acts chapter 19, we see an episode in the life of the early church where seven uh, sons of Sceva are using Jesus' name, the name of Jesus, as some sort of magic incantation. As if just using that name on its own without true faith in Jesus makes a difference. Of course, you can understand that in, in the book of Acts. Because we see the true apostles doing some fantastic things in the name of Jesus. But the, the name Jesus is not a, an incantation. It's not something we can manipulate. The categories of breaking this commandment are huge. Why is it so important? Well, the cause, thirdly, is answering the question, why is this so serious? Shouldn't violating this commandment be something where you can say, oops, sorry, slip of the tongue. I'll do better tomorrow, or I'll try and do better. Why would this in the Old Testament, and I believe going forward into the New, why would this be treated so seriously? Well, as I, I hope you still have your Bibles open in Exodus. If you have, please turn with me back. Just a couple of verses. Let's look at a couple of passages. Go back to Exodus chapter 3. And this is foundational for all the commandments, and this one in particular. You remember the situation... Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. If you remember when we looked at this passage, I argued that Yahweh... The word Yahweh, the term, has some sort of connection to the Hebrew verb to be or I am. It speaks to God in his sovereign self-existence. He is that he is. And his name speaks to the sum of his person, his character, and his essence. In Psalm 138, as David read to us, what did it say? He has exalted his name and his word above all things. We cannot divorce God from his word. We said that a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? Neither can we divorce God from his name. Another example, just turn across in Exodus to Exodus 33. Exodus 33, of course, is the... Um, the episode, if you like, of idolatry of the golden calf. But it's also a wonderful discussion between God and Moses. If you look at um, verse 18, 
And I'll just paraphrase here somewhat. Moses says to God, please show me what? That glory. Your glory. Note how Moses says, show. He wants to see it. He wants something in a sense of an experience where he sees the invisible God. And what does God answer him? How does God answer him? If you look in verse 19, the first part of verse 19, he says, I will make all my what? My goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. Isn't that interesting? That's interesting for us to think about. Moses says, on the one hand, show me. Let me see. I want to see you. And then the Lord says, I'll let you see by speaking. I will let you see by speaking. I can't be seen, but I will proclaim my name, the Lord, before you. I'll proclaim my name, Yahweh, and that will be my glory passing by. It's as if the Lord says, that's as much as you can take. The Lord passed before him, it says. Look in Exodus, turn over to Exodus 34. The Lord passed before him. And what does the Lord say? Well, he says, and I'm going to use the, uh, the name where he says the Lord. I'm going to use the Lord's name, Yahweh. Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head, as you would. Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. Now we dealt with this idea of visiting the sins of the father on the sons last time, didn't we? And we, talk, and we said not to go and fall into that trap of saying that God visits sins on innocent people. That is visiting sins to the third generation of those, you look back in, the, in Exodus 20, who hate him. God does not visit the sins of the father on the son unless the son carries on with those sins that his father committed. Read Exodus, sorry, read Ezekiel chapter 18 for some clarification if that's, you thought, there's, there's no sense here of what has been called generational curses. Or this sort of thing. It's just not there. But notice here, our point this morning is that God showed himself by speaking his name. You know, even as human beings, our names aren't unimportant to us, are they? They, at least in some way, mark and identify us. Over time, as people get to know us, our name embodies something of who we are. Think of the name of your child, your dad sister, your brother. None of us like to have our names ridiculed, twisted or made fun of. Why? Because even at a human level, your name matters. And how much more is that true of Yahweh? How much more is that true? As I say, Judaism would not permit people to say the name. And the, uh, and the, but the divine name is used in scripture. But it does tell you at least how much they revered the name of Yahweh. Everywhere in scripture, the name of the Lord is revered, is exalted in the highest possible terms. Psalm 8 says, O Lord, our Lord, O Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Psalm 29 says, ascribe to Yahweh the glory due his name. When we come into the New Testament, we see what is the first, in a sense, major prayer of the disciples' prayer that Jesus teaches us. That we are to make his name holy. Hallowed be your name. The apostles, too, proclaim the uniqueness of the name of Jesus. There is no other name under heaven by which men, by which we must be saved. Paul says to the Romans that anyone who calls on the, upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The very consummation of all creation, of all human history, will be when? It will be a time in the future when every knee will bow, every tongue confess 
that Jesus Christ is Lord. It says, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Notice here, too, that there is a consequence. This is the first, in a sense, um, commandment that has an explicit consequence. He shall not hold them guiltless. And I think that's, in a sense, put there simply to balance this idea, because we can often look at this commandment against the other two, first and second, and say, well, it's just not that important. Well, it's as if the Lord says, well, yes, it is, and I'm not going to hold you guiltless. Fourthly, or is it fifthly, I can't remember. Um, there is a counterpoint to all this. You see, there is indeed a command to make holy God's name. There are indeed many categories by which we've got to measure our uh, conversation. And by conversation, I mean not just our words, but I'm using it in the King James Version uh, of parlance of our whole lives, our conversation. There is, in a sense, you know, a consequence. But there is also a counterpoint. Because what this commandment is doing is not saying you must never use the name of the Lord. But it is a commandment that is, in a sense, an implicit invitation for God's people to use the name properly. And what does properly mean here for us? Well, it means worthily. That we, need, that we can use the name worthily in prayer. We can use the name worshipfully in praise. We can use the name willingly in witness. You know, three wonderful, broad, all-encompassing categories by which we can look and say, well, I've got to be careful, I want to, I want to be careful, I want to esteem, I want to worship the Lord, and this is how I do it. I can call upon the name of the Lord in prayer because he's adopted us into his family. We can call upon him and, and adore him in worship. We can raise our voices. Sunday by Sunday, the opportunity is given. Raise your voice. Worshipfully in praise. And we can speak of him willingly in witness. In our Bible study, we've been going through John chapter 19. It's taken us a while. Um, but we're going through that. We finished that chapter this last Thursday. And we were talking about um, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who come to claim the body of Jesus. And uh, Joseph of Arimathea is named in all four Gospels. He's a wealthy man. He's, he's, he's a secret disciple, John tells us. And at the death of Jesus, he, in a sense, he, he nails his colours to the mast and goes to Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus accompanies him. This, this disciple, who, this guy who comes to Jesus in John 3 at night and, asks, and, and sort of tries to get Jesus on side. And Jesus you know, issues those immortal words. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. That was news to Nicodemus. He thought he was already in the kingdom of God. We see Nicodemus again in John 7. And there's a, there's a development in his journey. He's now defending Jesus. He's now defending Jesus and saying, well, should we condemn a man without a fair trial? And then finally, it seems in John's gospel, he's, he's then worshipping him. He's then coming and standing in front of Pilate and others and, and taking the body of Jesus and in an act of adoration and respect for the body of Christ. He witnesses for him willingly. Friends, don't go away from this message and think, oh, I can't use the name of the Lord. You can. But use it properly. Use it worthily. Use it worshipfully. Use it willingly. Use it with a sense of love and adoration. Yes, we know our world, you know, the, the, the name of the Lord has been reduced to a... It's not even a curse by some people. It's just a way of speaking. They don't even mean anything by it in that sense. But friends, we are again, as the people of God, to be different. And we're to be different not only in terms of not using the, the name of Jesus or the name of God in a curse... You know, we're, we're not to be involved in using God's name in the service of falsehood. See, there are Christian categories here that we need to take account of. As we've seen from the Old Testament, the violation of this third commandment included things like perjury, lying under oath, where you solemnly swear that you will tell, what do we say when we go up there? 
and tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Or some of us actually affirm, don't we? We don't swear. We sometimes we won't put our hand on the Bible, but we will affirm. We say, I will affirm that what I'm saying is true because we don't even want to use the name of God that way. But as Christians, you know, we can fall prey to using God's name in the service of falsehood. We can profane God's name by accusing him of things that are false. Now there is a, a right way in scripture to lament and cry out. Jesus himself, taking that wonderful phrase in Psalm 22, says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But to be angry with God, or as some will tell you, to forgive God, I've forgiven God for this circumstance. As if he had sins or crimes against any of us. Is to call into question the very character that his name is identical to. And as I say, I don't, by, by saying that, I don't belittle anybody's circumstances. I've been through days, and some of you know some of the days I've been through, when my life didn't make sense. Then it would have, it would have been easier not to be here. But we, we remember that he is God, yeah. and we are not. To call on God's name to manipulate in order to manipulate a situation for us. Or so that he might lend us his power to our plans. Isn't that very akin to what we said earlier about sorcery? Using the name as an incantation? You know, the, the one thing the, the New Testament tells us about prayer and answered prayer is what? Is that God is not on a, a chain that we can pull and just ask him for whatever we want. But it's prayers in the name of Jesus according to the will of God. That will be answered. Somebody once said prayer changes things. Absolutely right. And the biggest thing it changes is me. The biggest thing prayer changes is us. So that, so that our will, our desires are more Godward. That they are pruned in line with God's will for our lives. See, see how we say things is important. Remember in my first church, somebody coming up to me, to me and saying that God has told me that I'm supposed to marry a certain young person, a certain young lady. Problem is, of course, that the Lord hadn't told the other lady. It's very easy to ascribe to God our own desires. It's important how we put things. You know, we've, we've not got to use God's name to give a sense of authority where it may not belong. That's important in worship too. How we say things is important. Claiming to hear the voice of God where he's not spoken is a violation of the third commandment. One commentator says this, and I, I wrote this down. He says, a more serious way to break the third commandment is by using God's name to advance our own agenda. Some Christians will say, the Lord told me to do this. Or worse, they say, the Lord told me to tell you to do this. We have to be very careful. Of course there is the leading of the Holy Spirit. But this is an inward leading. And it should not be misrepresented as an authoritative word that cannot be confirmed by circumstance or by the revealed word of God. We talk many times about that threefold chord. That's what the Spirit says. We'll accord with the word. We'll also accord with circumstance. When we say, and I'm as guilty as this as you, this is what God has said. Or in order to make things more personal, here's a, a word from Jesus. We've got to be very careful about what we lay on another person's, another Christian's conscience. When we're sharing, you know, I want us to share the gifts of the Spirit, to prophesy, to interpret, to give words. But we've got to be very careful to give people the room to question and to take it to the word. I don't see much place for thus says the Lord. What you can say is, I think the Lord is saying this. Will you take it and judge it? Will you, will you, will you, will you take it in prayer and take it to the word? And, and if you think that's right, there, there, is a, there, are, there are ways to do it. We're not to take God's name in service to frivolity either. Again, how does, why does God hear our prayers? Because we heap up lots of words? No. Matthew 6, 7, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. 
For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Why does God hear your prayer? Because of who he is. Because he loves you. Because you are his child. And because nothing can separate you from his love. He may not answer in the affirmative. God has the right as, be, as God to say no. We are not to use our, the name of our God in terms of falsehood, in terms of frivolity. We are not to use it carelessly. As I say in our worship, we are not to get... We want to be very careful with this one. I struggle with this a little bit. We are not to get distracted. It's very easy, isn't it? We are singing a hymn that we know. And, you know, um, at the name of Jesus. Oh, I wonder if the, the chicken's burning. <laughs> Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess. Oh, I wonder if I left the gas on. King of glory now. Tis the Father's pleasure. Oh, I don't like that shirt that he's got on today. We can be very careless in terms of who we're speaking to. And as I say, I'm not, I said, I don't want to make you afraid of speaking to the Lord. He's, he's the one that sticks closer to you than a brother. But we have to abide by what the scripture says in terms of, of reverence. We must think, feel, act and speak in a way that's proper for those who are called by the name of Jesus. We are included in his name. I know that in everything we do, we want to honour and reference that name properly. That takes thought. It takes intentionality, if you like. It takes a heart that desires God's glory. What does Colossians 3.17 say? With this, I'll finish this section. It says, whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything. In the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The Lord bless you. Amen. Going to come to the next part of our service. Let's just bow our heads in thankfulness and praise. Maybe one or two would like to lead us. If you want to lead us, please feel free to come out to the mic and just give thanks to God. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Great. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we can come before you, Lord, with our praise and worship and adoration, mm. because you alone are worthy, Lord. Mm. There is none like you, Lord. That's right. Mm. And Lord, we there is so much that we can we can thank you for, Lord. There's so much that you've done for us, Lord. And Lord, I want to just thank you this morning for what you've done for me, Lord. Mm. For the the things that you've brought me through, Lord. The things that I couldn't understand why they were happening, Lord. Mm. For the things that came against me in illness, Lord. I just thank you that you were there, Lord, That's to meet right. that need, Lord. And Lord, there is none like you, Lord. Mm. But most of all, Lord, we want to thank you for Jesus, Lord. Mm. We want to thank you for the, the person of Jesus who came to earth, Lord. Mm. Lord, who was the one who brought forgiveness, mm. that brought us to a place, Lord, where we could know you, Lord. Mm. Who shed his blood, Lord, that our sins would be forgiven, Lord, mm -hmm. whose body was bruised and marked and broken, Lord, Lord, for our sin, Lord. And even unto death, Lord, he did that, Lord, that we could come, come to you, Lord, that we can draw close to you, Lord, because of his, his actions, Lord, because of his deeds, Lord, but most of all, Lord, because of your great love and mm -hmm. mercy towards us, Lord. You are such a good and gracious God, Lord. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that not only in his dying and his suffering, Lord, he rose again, Lord, and that he's risen, he's ascending into heaven, and he seated us at the right hand of the Father, and he intercedes for us day by day, Lord. 
And Lord, we know that there's a day coming, Lord. Lord, where we, we will see you face to face, Lord. Where we will be with you, Lord. And Lord, although we, we don't want to hasten our time away from this earth, Lord. But Lord, we long for that time when we'll be with you, Lord. When we will spend eternity with you, Lord. So Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for everything, Lord. Yes. Even in these times, Lord, that we live in that we cannot understand, Lord. Help us through your word, Lord, that we've, that we've spoken about today, Lord, to know that you're in control, Lord. There's nothing that happens that you don't know about, Lord. There's nothing that happens, Lord, that you are not there in the, in the midst of it, Lord. And, Lord, that we can put our faith and our trust, Lord, into you, Lord, because you will work out all things, Lord, according to your plans and purpose. So, Father, help us, each one of us, Lord, wherever we are today, Lord, whether we're watching on, on Zoom, Lord, or YouTube, Lord, or together here, Lord, uh, in, in this church, Lord, just help each one of us, Lord, to draw closer to you, Lord, yes. to live in your word, Lord, to feed upon your word, Lord. <clears throat> and, Lord, I, I say that for myself, Lord, because I'm not the the best of people being disciplined, Lord. But Lord, I know your word is true. Yeah. I know your word will come to fruition, Lord. Mm -hmm. And Lord, just help us, Lord, to, to feed on that word, to trust on that word, Lord, and to know, Lord, that it brings us closer and closer to you every day. Yes, sure. Father, we just praise you. We, we just bless you. We just bring honor and glory to your mighty name, Lord, because there is none like you. And there is none worthy of all our worship and adoration. Mm -hmm. Father, we just thank you in that precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We thank you for your goodness. all the praise and all the glory and all the worship. Lord, we come and we thank you for that name which is above all other names. Mm -hmm. We thank you, Lord, that we can come and willingly bow before the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Lord, we just pray for those that don't bow the knee. Mm -hmm. And we just pray, oh God, is that we will be good witnesses for mm -hmm. you. Lord, that we won't use your name in any other way but a perfect way. Mm -hmm. Forgive us, Lord, when we do slip up. But Lord, we want to let you know this morning that we love you. Mm -hmm. Lord, we worship you. We adore you. Mm -hmm. Lord, we live for you. And Lord, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all you've done for each one of us. Amen. 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 Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can come before you in prayer. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Father, that we can remember, Lord, our nation, our world, those close to us. We can remember the lost. Or we can remember those who, who need you in particular at this moment. Uh, we think of those who are separated from us by means of work or sickness. We think particularly of our sister Dorothy. Lord, we pray for her in, in, the, in that home, that you would just bless her and put your hand upon her. Pray for our sister Sandra Atkinson, Lord. And Lord, again, you know the situation that she faces. And Lord, we pray that in that hospital bed that you would know your healing word. Yes. Father, we thank you for those who serve us. In terms of uh, doctors and nurses, we thank you, Lord, for their ministry. Mm -hmm. But, Lord, we recognize you as the great physician. Mm -hmm. And, Father, we recognize, Lord, that all of our times are in your hands. Father, we, Lord, we wonder at your sovereignty. We glory in who you are. We glory, Lord, and as we recognize, Lord, that all things come about, Lord, as you, as you have ordained from eternity past. Mm -hmm. And, Lord, we recognize, Lord, that, Lord, you are working out your purposes, even in our lives. Lord, thankfully, Lord, you have drawn us to yourself. And, Lord, we want your will, Lord, to be, to be done in earth as it is in heaven. Father, we ask your blessing upon us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're going to worship together around the table of the Lord. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, 
which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the, the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We invite you, if you know Christ as your saviour, to join with us as we share in the bread and the cup. The stewards will come round. They will bring the bread, obviously, that we are adhering to government guidelines. And so they will be masked and wearing gloves. And um, the bread is individually packed in a, in a little container. So please take one container each. And the cups are spaced out such that you won't need to touch anybody else's. So let's approach the table together. Um, worthily using the name of Jesus. Worthily using the name of God. For he has invited us together. As we take the bread, we remember that we are joined together in Christ Jesus as one family. We partake of Christ. We come before him, we remember his death, and we are nourished again by our faith in Christ Jesus. As we take the cup, we remember this new promise between God and his people. That whoever calls on his name will be saved. Him writer says, by Christ redeemed, in Christ restored, we keep the memory adored, and sure the death of our dear Lord until he comes. His body broken in our stead is seen in this memorial bread, and so our feeble love is fed until he comes. The drops of his dread agony, his lifeblood shed for us, we see. The cup shall tell the mystery until he comes. And thus that dark betrayal night, with the last advent we unite. By one blessed chain of loving right, until he comes. O blessed hope, with this elate, let not our hearts be desolate. But strong in faith, in patience wait until he comes.
as our benediction today. Just going to read those verses from Colossians in chapter 3. Starting from verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father <coughs> through him. Amen. Amen. Just before we depart, just a couple of things. Please, if you can wait in your seats until... Um, informed by the steward that you can leave. We'll be opening this door if you, if you need to leave this way. But if you can just wait in your seats and, and we can manage the outflow of people. Um, just to say that I'm on holiday this week, so I'd appreciate your prayers for a bit of rest. And um, also this week, from tomorrow onwards, tomorrow is virtually Keswick. So what we would have usually done, had we been in, in normal times, we'd have gone across the Keswick and partaken. So we encourage you this week, because uh, our services will, will be in advance this week, um, to join online with the Keswick community. Um, that's at virtually Keswick, and you can just easily search that. There are activities on from, I think, um, 11 o'clock in the morning through past till about 10 o'clock at night with, the, um, with their Bible studies in the morning at 11 and the evening celebration at 8. So we encourage you uh, to, to join with those and be blessed as we do that. Thank you. Okay. Well, folks... <coughs> The Lord bless you. Tail. Yeah, if you want. Do you want to use that mic there? No. So. <coughs> oh, it's okay. I'll, I'll stop. Okay, yeah. <coughs> Thanks, Tail. Um, just to, yeah, we haven't done, I know we haven't done the offering here, so we'll do, we'll do that as we go. Um, I, unfortunately, I had a conversation with Deep Paul recently, and I've got the wrong end of the stick for that. I apologise to everybody. Um, it, Teo has a, another job in Boston, in Lincolnshire, and uh, this will be their last Sunday with us. So what we'll do is we'll pray for them now, and uh, we'll send a gift. Um, is it, you're actually going on the... Are you leaving Whitehaven? On Friday. Oh, this is coming Friday. So, so we'll, we'll arrange to deliver a gift to the family. It's been great to have Depot, uh, when, he, when he's not been jetting around the world um, on business, Teo and, and, the two, and the two kids with us. As is the nature with uh, some of our families, particularly those working for the NHS, uh, their contracts end and, and, and there are also different jobs. So Teo is going to, uh, to Boston in Lincolnshire. And uh, what job are you doing down there? Okay, GP, so she's, she's going to continue in GP training down there. As I say, it's been great to have them with us. I've certainly enjoyed, I mean, Teo's been with us a bit longer than Depo, and uh, she's, been a, she's been a great blessing to us. Let's pray for them now, shall we? Yeah. Father, we thank you, Lord, that our times are in your hands. Yeah. Lord, you have a plan for each one of us. And Lord, in those plans, paths cross. And then they seem to uncross for a while, and then they cross again. And Lord, ultimately, Lord, they will cross one final time when we join together around your throne, and that will be for eternity. Yes. Lord, I thank you for Depot and Teo. Mm. We thank you for their fellowship with us over these months and years. Thank you for Teo, Lord, who uh, came to us first, and then the, uh, and the kids. We thank you, Lord, for, for those two little ones, and we pray your blessing upon them. Pray particularly in these times, Lord, where school has been disrupted. Lord, that you would that you would bless them. We pray, Father, Lord, for Teo's new job, that you would help and encourage her, Lord, in this. And we pray also for Depot in his career. Lord, that you would help him manage, Lord, the difficulty of, 
um, not being able to travel and to, and to attend in person to, the, to his business. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this um, lovely family. Yes. We thank you for them. We thank you for their faith in you. Yeah. We thank you for their desire, Lord, to, uh, to serve you, to know you, to fellowship in a local church. And Father, we pray that as they go to Boston, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that though it doesn't have hills, which is a shame, Lord, we thank you that God's people still meet there. And Father, we pray for them, that you would join them uh, quickly into a fellowship that, that cares for them, that preaches your word, that's faithful to the gospel. Father, we pray that you, would, that you would make them a blessing, even as they've been a blessing to us. Father, we ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.